Well, good afternoon. Um, I hope I won't bore you too much if you've sat through this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about something in more detail about lethal analysis control in Syria, where the Medjar Initiative has been operating since 2013 at the request of the US government. Um, when we entered into Syria in the war zone, um, from Iraq to Lebanon, there were reportedly 200,000 cases of cutaneous lethal analysis being reported by all the health partners on the ground. And there's very little actual data that was um, hard, but there were a lot of case reports. Um, data for leash analysis is not easy to gather, because unlike malaria and other diseases, there isn't a single time point um, for the disease when it's happened and then over after a short course of treatment. Leash analysis treatment can go on for a month or several months when the cases are severe. And the people will have to completely um, get into a habit of coming back time and time again to the health facilities to be treated. So it makes data quite difficult to pick apart of what's a new case and what's an old case. And we'll have to do a lot of work um, to really get down to standardizing the way data is collected. In um, Syria, the WHO um, last listed malaria cases at 55,000 for the whole of the country. The data collected by WHO, which is the official data comes through the system for the whole country, works on 18 million people living in Syria. And you can see the population uh, numbers and the case numbers at 55,000 for the country um, are what's in the official system. Not a surprise when you think that um, the epicenter of disease is actually in the side that's in conflict um, under the um, non-regime control. And uh, in the area that we deal with, and we support four and a half million people across the war zone, um, we pick up almost as many cases as the national cases, but only for four and a half million people compared to 18. It gives you a, an idea of how severe um, the disease has become, but also issues about um, data collection. Um, you know, 70% of all the national numbers in 25% of the population. Um, it's not totally irrational either because this disease has historically been grouped uh, around cities like Aleppo. It's called Aleppo button for a reason. Um, but it is also normally in most other parts of the country as well, but uh, hotspots are around Aleppo and Idlib. So why has the disease escalated? Because undoubtedly it has, um, and cases before the war were in the 30s and 40,000s per year. Um, 200,000 cases in 2013, and have gone down steadily as we've operated there. But why? Because of mass disruption to the healthcare system, um, we've had a huge number of health workers who've um, fled the country. Um, you've got population displacement um, at very large scale. Um, and you have um, increased risk of transmission. Half of the health workers fled the country. 700 health workers have been targeted and killed. Um, the Assad regime directly targets health facilities. NGOs who work there hold on to the coordinates of their health facilities and keep them secret because otherwise they get into wrong hands and they are directly targeted. We've experienced that. And that's made it very difficult for um, operators um, at health facilities. Population displacement. Um, you're dealing with a population of which out of the 18 million, um, 4 million have fled the country and are in neighboring countries, and um, the rest have been, um, uh, half of them are displaced inside the country, outside of the homes. So it's fairly extreme environments in which to work, um, both if you are a displaced person, half the population, um, or if, you're, um, if you are one of the refugees outside. Fortunately, refugees outside are less exposed to disease and disease transmission than those who are displaced internally in the country. Um, with so few health workers in the system, now many of the people who sit in health facilities are volunteers. Some of those used to be administrators in the health system. 
Some of them are community volunteers who've become local doctors. Um, all of them have uh, become the only form of healthcare um, for many people uh, served by the health facilities that remain open. Supply chains for medications and consumables all strangled um, and are down to really individual NGOs supporting the health healthcare system and the health supply chain system for the health facilities they support. It's, it is a mass population displacement and as I said with um, half of that population that remains, nine million people displaced at any one time and moving continuously, you see disease that moves as well. Um, this was a CDC map uh, put together and it shows where cutaneous leishmaniasis was in displaced people out on the edges where they could get to them um, and see the reports in, in camps and on the borders. And of course the disease has been carried from the epicenters as people have been displaced and crossed into Lebanon, crossed into Turkey, um, and crossed into Iraq even. Um, why is it so bad? Well, sandflies like to breed in the cracks of buildings. And if you drop barrel bombs on buildings, you create a lot of cracks. Um, also, if you wage war and isolate cities and towns, then the basic normal domestic services like rubbish management stop. Um, and when we started in Aleppo, we had fields as high as a house and kilometers long um, of rubbish, which had to be moved with bulldozers. And when you touch the rubbish with a bulldozer, a cloud of sandflies emerge. So domestic waste, as that's broken down as a clearance system, and the constant um, breakdown of buildings by physical destruction has created the absolute ideal environment for sandfly breeding. Um, and none of it's cleared or, or collected. It also creates a perfect environment for um, secondary hosts like rats and dogs, um, which also live completely uncontrolled and which for some of the leishmaniasis that's transmitted, they're an important host. Um, and the living conditions, as people are displaced, when you've got nine million people on the move, many of these live in the, in the detritus, many of them live in the remains of the buildings, and many of them live in um, refugee camps, IDP camps. And when they do, that makes it much easier for the sandfly population um, to have co close contact with humans because they're all packed together. Um, it makes it easier for the female sandflies to find a blood meal and it makes it easier for the disease to transmit. So challenges um, when we're doing disease control in this sort of setting, um, I talked this morning about integrating your vector control uh, approaches. Well, you need everything in this. Um, we have fantastic people working way beyond the normal levels of commitment because the disease is so pervasive in uh, different families. Every family has somebody who's got leishmaniasis. And when it's that common, people will take enormous risks. But situations are changing the whole time. Um, we support almost every health facility that functions across that four and a half million people. And we support them uh, in multiple ways. Um, but health facilities change by the week as to what's actually functioning and what's not functioning. Um, we run about 180 health facilities or support to, of which about 110 are static, but maybe 30 of those change every month, depending on which one has been bombed or which one staff have had to flee from. And new ones will then open up in more secure areas. So you have to move with it. Uh, environmental factors, constantly changing again. The war isn't static, it didn't generate rubble and waste and stop. It generates rubble and waste every day as more um, areas are bombed. Aleppo was the big target, now it's, now it's Idlib. Um, so you have to move as the disease keeps being uh, augmented in its transmission. But then you've got to deal with the realities that people are scared of chemicals in Syria for very good reason. They've had them used against them. So you have to use really good education to try and get people's faith uh, and access to households. We have more household access um, than any other agency working in the country because we're working with IRS and that means you have to get into people's homes. And we're spraying two and a half million people's homes a year in the war zones in the worst, uh, the worst areas. 
Um, but the access is always limited and you have to change routes and planning on a weekly basis. According to security, you have to deal with having your expats um, doing remote management from the border in Turkey and from Iraq. It makes monitoring and quality assurance more difficult. Um, even though we've got a fantastic Syrian team, it means it's a very logistically heavy operation. You've got to move supplies all the time into, into Syria across borders, which are often closed. And you've got to move them around inside a war zone with your staff. Um, we're working with very limited knowledge as to the entomology in Syria. There's very little before the war. Uh, we're working with two Turkish universities, sending out samples all the time to analyze both the types of sandfly we're, we're picking up and also the types of disease we're picking up. Um, there's been very little medical um, knowledge at the, at the scale needed to deal with um, the disease. There was only one dermatologist in uh, northern Syria when we began. Um, so we've had to do an awful lot of work. And populations, when they keep moving, cause a huge problem. We've been working with, as I say, every health facility that functions and um, plugging the gap as well, but working with all the, um, the Syrian health staff, whether they're official or non-official, training them how to do um, microscopy, training them how to use rapid tests for visceral leishmaniasis, and training them how to administer what's a very painful treatment of, of subcutaneous injections um, for glucantine or pentastam. But as you see from this picture, you can really change people's faces um, with good successful treatment. Um, and we work to change and train health staff as they become available. Um, and we plug the gap in the lack of health facilities as they shut down with a whole series of mobile clinics that are just designed to diagnose and treat. And they have our best staff in them permanently moving, doing mobile treatment clinics in all the areas where the health facilities shut down. Um, so they're very dedicated people. And when we're spraying, and we're spraying about two and a half million people's homes every year, um, it was Aleppo. It's now a, a bit of a no-go zone for us. All the other areas for Hammer, Idlib, Raqqa, those are areas we work in all the time. Um, in the urban settings, this is the tool of choice. Um, it works very well, but there's no knowledge on insecticide efficacy in Syria. There's no previous publications. We rotate our insecticides as a precaution. We use pyrethroids at the beginning. We've moved to organophosphates, uh, and we'll rotate again next year as well, just in order to avoid problems of, of insecticide resistance. We use nets. Um, they're not standard nets because sandflies are tiny. They're a third of the size of a mosquito. So these are long-lasting nets, but with very tiny holes in them, much smaller mesh. Um, they're well received, but again, we've got all the same problems of trying to get people to use them on a nightly basis as you would have in a malaria control program. And awareness and education. Um, we do a huge amount. This is a Muslim culture in war. Um, there are access issues with getting to women and female children. We have to strive all the time to make a balance of females on our teams. We can have 600 people operating in Syria at any one time when we're running big campaigns, several hundred all the time. But we work through YouTube, we work in mosques, we work in schools, and we work in the communities at the time of campaigns to deliver a plethora of different approaches to get messages across to people so that we build up trust and access for IRS campaigns, for net campaigns, and for increasing people's willingness to come and use the health facilities and to know where to go when it's mobile clinics. Um, and it's been an area of work we've really invested in very heavily. And results, well, they're very interesting. We've seen a, a very, very significant drop in prevalence of leishmaniasis for cutaneous over the time we've been operating. Um, and if you analyze this back, we would have to say that the reason you have a decrease in prevalence and very little change in incidence is because people can get to treatment and have their disease resolved much, much, much more effectively than they could before. Um, the incidence has really plateaued out. And although we got a, a, a drop from the initial figures that we were seeing, um, it's really plateaued not because we believe anything is failing in terms of vector control, but simply because as soon as you 
deal with one community and its vector control needs, Assad comes along and bombs another community. And as they bomb and flatten buildings in another community, you generate a whole new sandfly population and the disease starts to well up in another area. We're seeing with mass population movement, communities that previously didn't record disease now having disease because populations have fled the areas like Aleppo that carried the bulk of the disease before and they have now taken um, their own infected bodies and infected what were naive sandflies in other parts of the country. So we see the, mo the, the move of the disease in a very tangible way. So if we had no vector control, I think that the incidents would be going up um, and quite dramatically. We think we just about keep it stable by applying wide-scale vector control across all populations that we can access. Um, and that keeps the, it keeps the incidents about stable at the moment. Uh, but it's an uphill battle. It's a bit like pushing an elephant up a staircase. Not easy. Um, everything's against you. Thank you.